So welcome to the studio. Um, I'm making this video today because I've recently noticed that having posted two videos on YouTube about, uh, oh God, I don't know, five years ago, something like that, um, I've arrived at a thousand, over a thousand subscribers. So kind of by accident, really. Um, but just to, uh, to celebrate that, I thought I'd make another video <laughs> um, about today. It's going to be about charcoal drawing probably the the oldest form of drawing in the world um, just burned wood and I'm going to be using this copy of a painting by Rubens in the Louvre um, a copy I made in the Louvre Museum um, and I'm going to be using it just as a, a source for an image um, so I'll be doing a copy of my copy <laughs> um, for the sake of this uh, demonstration um, so the first thing we need to understand about charcoal is that uh, we always need to, like any drawing or any painting for that matter, we need to be constantly aware of the point of contact between the drawing material and the surface. Um, and what happens at that point of contact is going to work according to the nature of the materials. How soft your charcoal is, how uh, rough your paper is, how heavy your paper is, um, how smooth your paper might be, etc, uh, etc. Et so for example, um, if we just take a piece of charcoal from here, um, here's a convenient piece, well, you can have a piece about uh, this thick, um, charcoal comes in all thicknesses, it's just the, it depends on the thickness of the branch of the, uh, the tree that it's come from, because really it's just a burned um, uh, twig. Um, so you can get really thick pieces like this thick. Um, depending on the thickness of the branch and it depends on what kind of um, work you're doing. If you're working with a huge mural then you're going to be needing a very thick piece but I'm going to be working with a piece about this thick today um, and I'm going to keep it to this, this with this one thickness uh, and you'll understand more about that why uh, a little bit later. But let's just start from first principles. We've got three pieces of, uh, of paper here um, lined up along the top here. Um, one of them is very, very smooth. It's practically uh, plastic. Um, the next one is a piece of sketching paper. Um, and the next one is a piece of quite uh, heavy colored paper. Uh, so you'll see that uh, with almost no grain on this plastic surface, you try and make a mark and nothing comes, barely anything at all, because there's no um, abrasion that's going to actually take off any of this material and hold it onto the paper. So on this next piece, which is just a piece of sketching paper, not particularly good quality, then you'll see that we've already got quite a nice mark. And right away, I should say that uh, this is not a pencil, so you can make a mark with this, this broken edge at the end, which is going to be quite thin or you can make a mark with the entire flat surface of the edge of the charcoal, which is going to cover a lot of ground very quickly. You see? And now you can work back into this with your finger fingertips, because on your fingertips you have fingerprints, which, which will conveniently take away quite a lot of material. So you can work in right away an area of light into your drawing and you have five or four fingers and a thumb, so you can apply the edge of your thumb, you can apply the edge of your palm to take away material. So right away you see the, the, the potential in charcoal drawing. It's really, it's really kind of like painting um, more than drawing. Um, particularly when it's used um, in, the, in the manner that I use it, which is applying and then taking away and applying and taking away and smoothing it off and then reapplying. It becomes a lot more, more like painting than drawing. So if we move along to this piece, which is a, th a thicker, heavier piece of paper, and already we've got the added uh, element of color. So you can see here, it's a, th it's a heavy piece of paper with quite a lot of grain. So we're gonna get quite a nice dark line. And of course, Again, point of contact, if I apply a lot of pressure to the point of contact and I push down quite hard, I'm going to get quite a nice dark line. But if I ease back on the pressure, of course, just like with a pencil, I'm going to get a pale line. So it's, uh, I, I'm not going to hesitate to just to say the, the, the obvious, 
because I think sometimes we tend to overlook the obvious. Um, but anyway, that's, that's just a basic principle. And of course, this is giving us an understanding that we're not just, we not, don't have just the option of working on white paper, we also have the option of working on coloured paper of any colour we like. It can be almost black, it can be very pale, it can be any colour you like. Um, and of course, you can start introducing not just charcoal, but also um, chalk, uh, sangin, um, and if we're using this chalk, of course, chalk like anything else, it can be hard chalk or soft chalk. This is a very soft white pastel. You can see how easily it's coming off in my fingers. So this is actually gonna make quite a bright white and then gray according to how much we smooth it down. All kinds of interesting marks you can achieve with just the white, the black, and the blue. But anyway, today I'm just going to restrict myself just to charcoal on paper. And what we can do with just charcoal and applying the charcoal, taking it away, applying it, taking it away, and copying this beautiful lady here, who is apparently, um, probably uh, Suzanne Formont, the sister of Rubens's um, wife, his second wife, Hélène. Okay, so I've got my paper firmly attached to my board. I've got my model. Um, and I always like to think that uh, any work of art is a result of a series of decisions. And the quality of each decision is going to affect the final quality of the work of art, whether it be a painting, sculpture, piece of music, building, whatever. Um, so, the first decision I'm making is uh, what am I going to use to make the thing? And I've got the paper, I've carefully chosen the grade of the paper, the weight of the paper, it's about, um, in this instance, 250 grams, uh, quite a, a heavy piece of paper, nice grain, it's going to take a, a, give me a good velvety black when I need it, um, but it's also quite resistant if I want to be working back into it and taking away things and, and rubbing it, etc, etc. Uh, this is the piece of charcoal I'm using, and I'm going to be using exclusively this piece. So, you know, I could use a very thin piece, or I could go very much thicker, uh, and I could go really thick. I mean, a piece of charcoal is only really um, as thick as the original twig that it comes from, from the willow tree. So, you know, you could have a piece of charcoal that thick if you're working on a huge uh, uh, mural and you wanted to cover a lot of space very quickly. But I like to um, set myself the challenge of using just one, one thickness. So every mark that I need to make is going to come from this one piece of, of charcoal. And the reason I do that is because you can be, one can be inclined to get into too, too much finicky detail. And if you think, look at the work of uh, the, the greats like um, uh, Velasquez and, and Rubens and Manet, um, who uh, particularly admired Velasquez, um, they were working with pretty big brushes. Um, and when they were drawing, they were drawing with pretty, pretty he hefty pieces of charcoal. Um, and so every mark they made, every kind of part of the image, was made with that piece. So they couldn't, they, they deliberately restricted themselves um, to a particular range of marks. Uh, and so that, uh, imposing that limitation on oneself, forces one to, to look for different ways of creating an image um, and, and saves you from going into too much um, unnecessary detail but we'll see how that develops if you go along. So I've got a piece of black piece of paper here. Um, I've got my model. You'll notice that her, her left eye is pretty much right in the center of the image. Um, and that is just a simple, simple way in portraiture of placing the, the, the face nicely central, but not making the mistake of, of considering the nose as the center. Um, because here, the eye is pretty much equidistant between this edge and this edge. So really, um, the eye is in the center and everything else is, 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 is distributed around it, so it's creating a nice balance. Um, so, if this is our central line, more or less, um, we're looking at maybe two-thirds of the height. So I'm going to place the eye there. 
So I'm going to be going pretty fast now, um, just getting down the basic shapes. Here's here, more less, more there. Now these lines are going to be here. Um, they're going to be visible right, even right at the very end when the painting is, when the drawing is finished. These lines are probably going to be just about visible. Um, but I'm not worried about that because they're going to create a kind of history of the painting that's going to be visible uh, beneath the finished image. But that's what I'm showing you here is the way I work. Um, it's not necessarily the way you're going to be working eventually, but it's just sharing with you my almost half a century of experience. I've been drawing with charcoal since I was a small boy. Um, so I'm really just showing you how I work and, and if it's useful to you, then, then that's great. Um, so let's get this in roughly. Now I suspect that Rubens has accentuated the size of the eyes which is a, sim a simple trick to really create a, a very seductive effect. Okay, so we're just getting the basic shapes down. And so far I've been drawing with the point, but now I can start maybe base laying in some basic zones of tone with the side of the charcoal. Now, anybody watching this now, I dare say that some of you are starting to feel a desire to, to, to tap away on the keyboard, some kind of reference to Bob Ross. So please keep that to a minimum. Um, <laughs> I'm British, I didn't really grow up with Bob Ross on the TV. And I've seen some, some of the videos, some of the, some of the programs he made. It's pretty interesting stuff. So really, one thing that I would tell you now, um, right from this, at this point, is that not to be worried that it looks rubbish. <laughs> because at this stage of a drawing, it always will. Um, and all these years of experience have taught me to just be patient. You, ha you have a pretty good idea of what's coming. You've got to work at it stage by stage um, and just give yourself some Cut yourself some slack. One thing I like to do throughout a piece of work like this, whether it's a drawing or a painting, I have in my studio uh, a piece of equipment which, ev which many artists have in the studio, which we use a great deal to help us uh, create balance in a piece of work, and that is simply a mirror lined up behind us so that we can look at our work in the mirror. Because already by this stage, I've been working on this for a certain amount of time, and I've, I'm in, in danger of, of losing an objective analysis of the piece. Um, so looking at it in a mirror will help me to appreciate whether, the, uh, whether this eye is too high, whether they're nicely in line, whether the nose is nicely in line with the lips, and, and that everything is kind of coming together. Um, so I'll show you what I mean by that. So if I swivel the camera around, you will see that I have a mirror set up so right away she looks like she has a black eye but that's uh, just because I've got to, I've been drawing the, uh, the eye brow in but this allows me to to see that through that clearly the uh, the, the eye that I've been working most on is uh, is looking way too pronounced so I need to calm that way down bring the eyebrow down and uh, maybe the ear is a little bit too high but it gives me an idea of where, of where, we're, where we're headed so we've got the piece of charcoal that we're using but we also have the option of working in with a just a piece of rag here it's quite a heavy piece of rag and uh, I'm going to do now what I often do with my charcoal drawings. And again, it's what I do, not necessarily the only way to work. But I'm going to 
um, incidentally, with charcoal, be careful when you scratch your nose, um, because you're going to get dirty with charcoal. Um, so you can be scratching your, your head and whatever, and then you go out to the bakery to get some bread and you wonder why people are looking at you strangely, um, because you might have just black marks all over the place, so just check it before you leave the house. But charcoal is a very messy way of working. So here I'm going to just completely rub it down. And this is taking me away from a particular style of charcoal drawing, which would be deliberately not rubbing into it, just using the mark of the charcoal on the paper um, and drawing in a, in a dry fashion, uh, is the expression I use, as opposed to painting into it with your fingers, rag, um, the, the, the charcoal and uh, an eraser, which I'll be showing to you in a moment. But with this technique, um, I like to completely grey up the paper and you end up with the original marks as a guide, but also a grey surface which you can use to work into with the other piece of drawing equipment we have with charcoal is this, which is a putty eraser. What the French call a mie de pain um, and uh, originally, way back in the time of Velasquez and Rubens um, in the 17th century, um, they might well have used um, bread white that you would take out and knead into a shape like this and it acts as an eraser. But now we have a particular uh, commercial material, but if you, if you don't have any of this, the putty eraser around, you can just use a bit of old bread and, and, and make a, uh, a bread eraser. Uh, and the wonderful thing about this is that you, again, it's the point of contact. So if you want to make a, a broad uh, mark by taking away some of the material, then you create a broad surface on the eraser and you can draw in like the light in the cheek here, or the light on the forehead. light down the nose, etc, etc, and give yourself a kind of like a, an indication of the, the dominant zones of light. And we already start seeing some volumes appearing. I love this raised eyebrow here, it's so cute. Now, I've spoken about uh, using the mirror. Um, another thing we need to do frequently is step back. Don't spend your entire time right up close to the image. Lean back, get up off your chair. You might already be standing. Just take a few steps back, take a look at your piece, um, and right away I can see that there's a problem between the, the the distance between the mouth and the nose. Um, so if I bring the nose down, that's also going to solve the problem of the distance between the nose and the eye. This eye might need to be brought up a little bit, but that kind of thing, again, in the mirror and from a distance, it becomes more evident. So I'll use my palm to take away some of this material here. And Bring the nose down. And it really is a fun medium to use because a lot depends on the pressure you're applying, the, the kind of the, the depth of the dark, the blacks you're going to get, uh, or uh, very, with a very light touch, you can have a very light uh, gray or just a light indication of a contour. Um, and there's always the opportunity to take the material away again. So with a piece of charcoal like this, all the time you're working, you are constantly swapping between the, the broad strokes and the, the delicate strokes.
pale strokes and the dark strokes. So it really is a very fluid and exciting material to use because you're not constantly going backwards and forwards between your, your image and your materials. You've just got this one thing in your hand and that is your point of contact with the drawing and the entire thing is realizable with just some very basic tools. You know, it takes us right back to the cave, the caveman times where you did bits of burnt wood and they were drawing on walls. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a really uh, exciting thing to, to, to use. Very elemental way of, 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 of painting and expressing yourself. But again, once again, I like to insist, insist that an artist is a business person like anybody else. And an artist always has a clear understanding, if they are making a living out of the work, as I do most of the time, um, a pretty clear understanding of who you are working for. I mean, there are a lot of people who don't like this kind of thing at all. And, okay, fair enough. Um, I'm not relying on them for a living. But, you know, there's this room for everything in this world. And it would be a shame to lose this kind of this kind of work just because it might be unfashionable. Okay, how we're we doing, Mira? <laughs> okay, not bad. Got a problem here. Okay, that's easily rectified. So to get this light on the nose here, all I do with my putty eraser is create a kind of screwdriver edge. If I can get that in the camera, yeah. To create just the, just the degree of, of light and the shape of light that I need on the, on the tip of the nose. Maybe just slightly darken it up there, but take a bit of material from here, put it on the nose and then work back into it to create effect of light on the tip of the nose. So once you've got material down on the on the page, on the paper, there's a very dark zone here. So I can keep using this as a kind of source for material. And it gives me just sometimes just the right degree of of tone that I need in a particular zone like here down the side of the nose. Let's smooth this line off here. Get that kind of sfumato effect which Rubens loved. So once again we've got this the line of the light on the eyelid, the upper eyelid, so making a a kind of a screwdriver shape, just a nice line, and I can pick out that light along the top of the eyelid. Okay, let's get a bit, get a, get in a bit closer, I think. So now we've got a closer look. You can, can see more readily what's happening. So I'm just going to pick out the eyes here. So really being careful about what kind of uh, edge of the charcoal is coming into contact with the paper. If I want to take away a piece of a line that heavy, the edge of the, uh, the pupil there, before going in with the eraser, I'll just take away the, the major part of the line with my fingertip to get rid of most of the material and then clean it up with the putty eraser. And all the time I'm working, even though I'm concentrating on this eye at the moment, I'll allow myself to, to go back into other areas 
so that the entire drawing at any given time is worked up to the same level so that if I were to stop it would have it would have a kind of self-contained uh, level of finition so as I mean there are artists who are quite happy to completely finish one section and then go on to the other section and then go on to the other section but uh, it's much more um, it's much easier to 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 maintain the balance by working on the entire thing globally uh, at the same time Now, if you want a really nice sharp edge, the best way to do that is simply to snap it and you've got a perfect sharp edge, which you can then use to touch in very delicate areas like this. And this is probably a, a pretty good way of working for somebody who's getting on in years, whose hand might start shaking a little bit, and uh, because uh, that doesn't—it's not really so much of a, uh, of a problem. Um, that can even, I can well imagine, kind of approaching that age myself, I can well imagine that that would be an interesting limitation to work with, because if you look closely at a painting by Velázquez or Manet. It's far from precise. It's really, you can almost get the feeling that their hands are trembling as they're working, but it creates a very dynamic surface. You hear me dabbing at it? It's not just rubbing, it's also, it's all kinds of effects you can get. Look at this line of, well, you can't see it from here, but there's a line of light just coming up the side here. Barely distinguishable, but it's there. And also while I'm working, um, quite a lot. I'm, um, I'm squinting, just closing, completely closing one eye and squinting through the other to, uh, to just enhance the tonal values. You see what is the lightest and what is the darkest. Um, and when you're looking at your model, you can see much more clearly when you're squinting um, how deep the shadow needs to be. Like this shadow down the side of the face is not strong enough yet. So here I just enhance it a little bit. And attenuate it. And that's better. And there's a very interesting bit of reflected light under her chin, which is very lovely. Gives a very interesting volume. Now Rubens must have been very fond of this woman to have painted such a beautiful portrait of her. And that would be understandable if she was his sister-in-law and he already was passionately in love with his, with his wife. So I'm barely holding the charcoal between my fingers. It's very lightly held. So it's, I'm just allowing it to barely touch the surface of the paper, just to create that delicate shadow under her nose. And likewise here, I'm just taking away a little bit of material here, but then when I want to create that light 
and here then I can really apply some pressure now this lip needs to come up but I don't want to line under that under that lip because there's a continuity of the flesh along here along this edge here so one common mistake is to create a line as if as if there's lipstick on the lips, but that's not the case here. Now, another thing I'd like to show you is we can work into it with our fingers. You know, you've got, you've got four fingers and a thumb. Um, so if your fingers get too dirty, all you have to do is just lick your forearm and get that into the image and then just rub it off. So you mustn't be afraid of getting dirty, but now that finger is clean again, make sure it's dry, and you can use it again. But I also have this, which is a blender in the shape of a pencil, but it's just solid cardboard, which can be used for very delicate uh, touches. You can get them in all kinds of thicknesses, um, I use it sparingly, but it's sometimes useful for the most delicate lines. And again, you can take some of the material from here and apply it as and when you see the need. Okay, so I could go on with, with this for some time, but for the purposes of the demonstration this is sufficient and uh, and it's a perfectly respectable drawing as it stands um, but just for the sake of the demonstration I wouldn't normally do this but there is also the option of working into it with chalk Oh, and I've forgotten to do the earring. That might be useful. Let's have a look at uh, how we might approach that. So, you see the earring here. It's quite a delicate thing to do. So I'm going to start by taking off, or putting in the putting in the basic uh, background dark area that I'll need and then taking off some material with just my fingertip to create a, a zone of light So we've got the basic shape in, and then we can just emphasize the dark behind it, the shape of the earring. zone in the center there a bit of reflected light on the edge and a point of light in the center Now this is a good example of where I might be inclined to what some might say cheat <laughs> a little, but the end effect is what's important and the great, the great masters never worried about any kind of accusation of, of cheating. They just the, the end result was the most important thing. 
So I might be inclined here to come in with a bit of white chalk just to put in that point of light. And having done that, I might do the same thing with the eye. Just to emphasize that point of light there. And while I'm at it, again, this is something which uh, doesn't appeal to everybody. You might feel that it's a, it's gilding the lily, but The thing, if you look closely at this painting in the Louvre, next time you're, if you're in the Louvre Museum, um, look very closely at her eyes, then you can see the, the water in her eyes. You can see the freshness in her eyes. It's extraordinary. There's just a line of water running along the edge here. Very soft chalk. This, is, this kind of thing is very tricky because uh, you can go too far with it. So you've really got to understand where to, where to stop. So, just sketching the lace here. And for the purpose of the demonstration, I think that's pretty much good enough. Stop, stop. <laughs> uh, okay. So I've made this video really because uh, I noticed that uh, I have uh, over a thousand subscribers now. Um, so I wasn't really intending to, uh, to concentrate on YouTube at all. I just made, put up a couple of videos about uh, making and applying gesso uh, but since I have that many subscribers I felt it, um, I needed to put up another video um, so don't hesitate to make any comments in the comment section if you're interested in any, in any particular technique which I might be able to help you with if it's in my repertoire. Um, my other videos are on the subjects relating to the guitar uh, and I'm not sure when people are subscribing, whether they're subscribing for this material or for the guitar related stuff. <laughs> so you might want to mention that in the comment section as well, um, uh, just so I know who's interested in what. All right, so I hope you find this useful and uh, see you next time.